Over a thousand local Afghans show up in the space of only a few hours in the hope of being treated by medical staff. It's a topical for her body wherever she hurts, okay, for her joints. American and British forces have joined together in a project called a MedCap, or Medical Community Aid Post, which provides free medical treatment to Afghan people. But then after you have your baby, come back and we'll give you meds. Pretty much we want to be able to give the local community um, the basic, you know, basic vitamins, basic um, medication that would help them on their day-to-day. -day. She has very high blood pressure. Muscle and back pains, swelling, respiratory problems and stomach aches. These are some of the more common ailments which locals come to get treated for. I'm going to get you some medicine. Are you allergic to any medicine? There are some, some decent cases that definitely could use the attention that we can give them and uh, I'm glad that they're here. So. If the doctors come across any severe cases, then they will treat the patient on the spot before referring them to the local hospital. Projects like these take place every month across Afghanistan, but this visit is a first for the people of Kuala Wazir. So we decided to come here, uh, provide whatever medical assistance we can, medicines, uh, medical treatment, and try and help this village on its way. It also shows the locals that the British and coalition forces that are here today are here for their benefits and not just as a force that is um, situated in their country. An Afghan not lining up to receive treatment is Abdul Sata, a translator for the United States Army who feels that only good can come from these types of projects. It will help uh, people and uh, it, it will also help the NATO, the international uh, forces in this country to get into the heart of people. A week before the MedCap is scheduled to happen, the local elder is given 750 tickets which he distributes among the villagers. We use one of the local Maliks to ensure that the locals turn up at the right time. We try and treat between 750 and 1500 locals on a single MedCap. Everyone who holds one of these tickets will be seen. However, after that, there is the potential for anyone still left in the queues to get treated. Today, hundreds of people have received crucial medical treatment from UK and US forces. It is a testament to these two nations that they have managed to treat everyone that has shown up. In the short term, the aim is for the military medics to provide as much needed medical aid possible to the people of Afghanistan through such things as a MedCap. In the long term, what the coalition forces are here to do is stabilise the country, but also give the government the necessary kudos and capability to run their own country and their own healthcare systems, and therefore, in the future, events like this won't be needed because the healthcare will be in place. This is William Bonnet for the NATO Channel in Afghanistan. In a region where there's frequent contact with the enemy, it's important to be ready for anything. It's the training Lina and her army colleagues get in theatre on the ground here in Helmand that keeps their life-saving skills primed. As they get underway with a mock scenario, it's not long before the role play turns into real life. Yes, today we're doing a simple trauma team training at the infirmary. We will have uh, two casualties coming in. The first one uh, has been shot in his uh, left arm and left leg, and the other one will be uh, injured by an IED and have blast injuries and uh, shrapnels. We try and make it as uh, real as possible. We're using uh, real victims or people, but fake blood and fake wounds. The first of the injured victims is lying on the operating table. Medics have to work through the cries of their patients, keeping their focus on the critical priorities. The reason why we're doing the fake casualties is to work on the standard operating uh, procedures for A, B and C. And A is for airway, B is for breathing and C for circulation. Suddenly, interrupting the training, the medics receive a message from the main gate. There's a real casualty coming in, so they stop what they are doing and prepare to treat an Afghan policeman who's been shot in his leg. When the ANP arrived at the infirmary, we uh, are using our standard operating procedures is uh, checking A, airway was OK, B, breathing was OK. We had a C problem, circulation problem. He was bleeding from the wound. So we used one of the procedures uh, called pack to bone, where we put in some gauze wraps into the wounds to stop the bleeding. After 15 minutes, we are allowed to loosen the tourniquet, which we did. 
and uh, the bleeding had stopped, so he was stabilized. As soon as the ANP arrived at the infirmary, we sent a request for medevac for Bastion. We've done all we could to stabilize him, so he would go with a helicopter to further treatment in Bastion. The Afghan policeman survived with no permanent damage to his leg. For Lena and her team, this case, however, proved how important it is to be prepared for any incident which could happen at any time. William Bonnet at Forward Operating Base Price, Helmand, Afghanistan. Every mother and child should have the right to good health care. But in the rural district of Mirbashakot in Kabul province, women were losing their lives in childbirth. This is Mirbashakot's brand new clinic. It didn't come to be through international or charity donations, but through the hard work and determination of the people of this district. The National Solidarity Programme is the most successful Afghan-led reconstruction effort in Afghanistan. Through the mentorship of the Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development, villages democratically elect community councils and come together to discuss what their districts really need, whether it be a clinic, a school or safe drinking water. The National Solidarity Programme has made a very big change in our lives. People who have lived through three decades of war have been brought together. People who are separated, even killing each other for superficial reasons, this program has brought them together. The distance between Kabul and Mir Bashakot means it's difficult to transport sick people even if we have vehicles, so we decided we should have our own clinic. The program is different because, unlike government projects or foreign aid, it transfers decision-making and financial responsibility to local people and requires they put their own money in too. This can lead to greater confidence and less money lost through corruption. What makes it difficult is that the communities have been looking to the development as a kind of emergency support every time. That's why they were not owning it. So through National Solidarity Program, the communities feel that ownership. That's why even in insecure areas, we have the communities who actually defend the program. But crucial to this process is the women. They have their own council and they said the clinic was vital to their community because it's the women that are dying, not the men. There's the story of a woman at the time when there were no roads. She was from a remote village and she was pregnant. They were taking her to the hospital, but before she reached it, she died. Around, no, more than 20 or 30 women have died like this. We witnessed how bad this situation was for this woman, so we named the hospital after her, Mariam. The clinic's official name is the 20-bed hospital of Mir Bashakot, but locally they call it Mariam Clinic, in honor of the woman they lost. Women can understand women better, and in my opinion, I don't think men can understand women's problems. Before, when a woman wanted to talk about her rights, she was slapped down because she was a woman. But now women are smarter, more aware about their rights. And that's why we founded these councils, so we can be independent and we don't have to go begging to our men. In this society, men and women are equal and they have the same rights. They're all human. As the men have a hospital, the women also have the right to have a specific hospital where they can be treated, their problems can be solved, and we will not see any mother or baby die again. When the money comes straight to the hands of local councils, the people can put forward their problems and try to solve them. It's part of essential change to rebuild our cities and our society. We are witnesses to that. The community are now waiting for medical supplies so they all can have access to clean medical services that will hopefully see generations of Mirbashakot residents delivered. This longevity is also a crucial part of the programme and key in the transition of responsibility to Afghans. This is Afghan led. This is for them, done by them. They decide what their priorities are, they decide how much money they're going to put into it, they make the proposals, they learn how to do the accounting, they come up with everything and execute the project themselves and therefore it is theirs from beginning to end. This is Ruth Owen in Afghanistan for the NATO Channel. Girls at the Naswani No. 2 school read lessons at early morning classes. The hundreds of girls and preschoolers who study here in Faizabad in the very north of Afghanistan aren't sitting outside to enjoy the weather. This school lacks sufficient classrooms and teaching materials for everyone. 
However, Principal Pashtun Shana says the standards at her school are still high. During the 16 years I've been principal of this school, it was destroyed. We don't have walls, classrooms, chairs, books or stationery. But this is not a problem for us. Our studying is good. And right now we hope the government will pay more attention to education and supply the equipment we need. The results back her up. There are more girls from this province of Badakhshan in Kabul University than from anywhere else in Afghanistan. The girls here study hard at mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology and English. But they're frustrated that the lack of classrooms and basic learning materials could have a negative impact on their education. You look at uh, these students, and these students, with these students, uh, when the um, weather is very warm, uh, so they uh, become sick. We can say, uh, when the weather uh, is very rainy, so uh, we can't read our uh, our lesson for like for good. It's very important for us. Uh, we don't have uh, extra uh, library, and also uh, we don't have any books, uh, enough books for a study. Rosemary Stashek from American charity A Little Help has come to the school to aid these ambitions, with donations of tents for temporary classrooms and learning materials. Lasting peace and security in Afghanistan is not just reliant on a military solution. NATO needs civilians like Rosemary to bring their support and expertise to the country. We brought so much stuff. We brought an entire library um, for grades 1 through 12, including books for girls who are just learning to read, right on up to girls who are studying for the university entrance exam. We also brought lab equipment for biology, chemistry and physics. We brought skeletons, organ models, all kind of charts, chemicals, you name it, whatever you might need to run a very basic, you know, science program that will help these girls prepare for university. We try to give it to them. But not everyone agrees with girls education and elsewhere in Afghanistan, girls schools are targeted for attack, teachers threatened and pupils intimidated into not attending. A society is really built upon how it treats women. Women really are in the home. An uneducated woman can't help either her sons or her daughters to become educated. And so when you educate a woman, even if she doesn't go to university, she really is the linchpin in that family. And she can really help make sure that the sons and the daughters for the next generation have everything they need to be educated. It's, it's an investment in the future. You can't, you, can't ration, you can't ration that because you'll pay the price a generation later. This is Ruth Owen in Badakhshan province for the NATO Channel.